Great job. Fully known and fully loved by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. You know, folks, that's true. When we don't think so, we don't feel like it, and the circumstances don't dictate it. God is still good all the time, and He is worthy of our praise. Amen? Amen. 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 Wow. Well, it is great to be here today. Mike, thanks for doing such a good job leading, and y'all are full of leaders. This is a great church. Uh, I was talking to several of you, and I remember having great conversations. It's hard to believe. Um, where's Randy Hazen? Uh, Randy was the first one to invite me last year. It's been a year. It was November a year ago, but it doesn't seem like it's been a few months because I recognize several of you right off the bat and who you were. Had good conversations with you. So it's an honor to be back. I appreciate that. Do pray for your pastor today. He's preaching at Lillington Baptist. Um, the pastor there, Daniel Selman, is a young pastor from Georgia, doing a great job, really trying to bring in other evangelistic uh, pastors and really trying to move his church forward. So I appreciate that. Also, um, just to visit with you for a little bit, I'm excited about your building. I'm excited too. I'm excited because <laughs> it's not just a building. It's a ministry operations center, and you've got to think of it like that. Um, I'm a member at First Baptist in Garner, and uh, we have a Christian Life Center. We just call it the CLC. Uh, I always tell people, build a gym, build a gym, a regulation gym, and then call it something else. You know, you know, community center, family life center, Christian center. What are you all calling yours? Family life, center. family life center. There you go. Here's the deal with that. You can operate that thing seven days a week. It's amazing what you can do with a building and a facility like that. Now, the way you all are set up, it's kind of hard not to see your, your chapel building here next to it. But ours is set up on the main road, so half the people have never been in our sanctuary, and everybody in the community has been in our gym. Um, Red Cross uses it. Highway Patrol uses it. The, um, the school system uses it for meetings. Uh, when we have community meetings in Garner, the 9-11 uh, the celebration for the city was done in our gym. There's so many different things you can do. And that's not even mentioning upward basketball and upward cheerleading. Uh, our Hispanic ministry uh, does indoor soccer. Uh, we have a ministry called Community of Hope, which is separate from the church, but they operate out of our building. And they do all the, the food pantry, the clothing ministry, the counseling, English as a second language, after school program, summer camp. Uh, and, and I can just go on and on. Ronnie said, well, just tell them some of that. So I'm telling you some of it. And, and the reason I'm excited is it's not just a building. And don't ever let it just be a building. Let it be a ministry operations center. Amen? Amen? And you just heard all the few things that I mentioned that can be used for. Ours is used seven days a week. And so uh, as I drive by here, and I, I'm, I'm all over the county, as you can imagine. I, I pray for all of our churches, pray for our pastors every Sunday. Uh, I've sat in your parking lot. Uh, probably two or three times in the last three weeks and just prayed for y'all and prayed for your building. And uh, one day I, I drove in, pulled up, and drove out and then didn't realize that, that Ronnie was here. <laughs> I said, well, I'm already down the road now, but I'll just talk with you on the phone. Uh, but I just wanted you to know that's a, a great opportunity. Also, we have a special guest with us today, and I, I want to recognize him, introduce him, Admiral Indel Lee. Uh, stand up real quick so they can see where you are and turn around. And uh, He is... Um, the deputy chief of the Navy, Naval Chaplains Reserves, but he's also with the North American Mission Board, and he is the catalyst for the North American Mission Board for uh, military communities ministry. So he is, uh, works with all the military, uh, and particularly military communities, and he's uh, at Fort Bragg last night, um, he's visiting with us here today, and he and I are going to be riding around Western Harnett uh, where we're going to be planting churches. We've got a church planter, Barry Murray, who is coming back to North Carolina. He's been up in New England for 18 years planting churches, and he's coming back, and he's going to be living just right down the road from him. He's going to be in Lexington Plantation. I think they're closing on their house at the end of this month. And so, um, but he's going to be focused in the, a little further west, uh, kind of Buffalo Lakes North area. Uh, ideally planted, uh, the church hopefully would meet uh, like at um, Western Harnett Middle. So that's kind of kind of the direction that we're going because there's a lot of people out there, y'all know. We've got some churches in this area, but very few out that way. Uh, so uh, make him feel welcome. I'm glad he's here today. He's a friend, and I'm really glad that uh, he's worshiping with us today. All right, well, let's, uh, let's jump in and uh, appreciate. I got my, my clicker in my pocket. My, my heroes, Eric and Jeff, are back there. So all right, we're working. Uh, my web like just my name, MartyDupree.org, has a lot of free resources. Just click on resources, how to pray for your children, how to pray for personal revival, evangelism crash course, um, 
how to have a quiet time. There's just a lot of free resources right off that website uh, that you're welcome to uh, click on, and hopefully that'll be helpful to you. I'll put some resources out there as well. Now, today we're going to be talking about lifestyle evangelism, being an all-mission Christian in your daily life. I got a chuckle in the bulletin. It said, Marty Dupree is going to speak on confrontational evangelism. <laughs> well, that, that has been in the past. We have done some of that. But this is really going to be more about conversational evangelism. The next time I talk to you, I'm actually going to speak on that exact topic of conversational evangelism. But this time we're talking about uh, lifestyle evangelism, uh, but it is going to be more conversational in our approach. And I want you to think of yourself as a missionary. That's why I put missional living. Uh, we're not just soldiers. We're not just military. We're, we're, uh, we are missionaries for Jesus if you're a believer. Amen. When you walk out of this door, you're on the mission field. Whether you're going to the barber shop or to get your hair fixed or you're going to the grocery store or you're going to work, you're on the mission field. The mission field is all around us. Uh, just real quick, uh, Endel, I'm curious about this, but I want you to look around. How many of y'all are serve active duty right now uh, in, the, in the military in general? Any, any branch of the military, active duty. All right, how many of y'all are retired military? Wow, almost as many. How many of you are serving the military in a civilian capacity? All right, about a third, about a third, about a third, but um, a lot of active duty. Thank you for serving. I, I appreciate that greatly. Um, glad to have my son home. He, um, he's back in North Carolina. Uh, he's that one right there uh, and his wife. And that's their little baby. Who, the picture's a little bit old now because she's a year and a half and they're pregnant with number two. And uh, that's kind of what prompted him to get out. But uh, I, I was telling, um, I guess I was telling uh, Mr. Hash here that uh, my son is starting to miss the military because he's missing the order and the discipline. He's a plant supervisor and uh, he's dealing with people that show up at work on Monday and don't come back till Thursday. And he, he said, Dad, I'm missing the military now. So uh, <laughs> he's having that. I've got five children. Please pray for me, and uh, this will increase your prayer life. Uh, my youngest daughter, Harper, is 14, playing volleyball. Uh, Darcy is 24. She's a nurse at Duke and surgical ICU. Courtney is uh, 25, and her husband, Al, they live in Charlotte. Uh, she manages contract workers uh, for Bank of America, and that is a headache job. She's getting ready to go to grad school. Um, and then... My son, Wheeler and Logan, they went to NC State. I know there are some state fans here. Um, and then Dawson is uh, 18, playing baseball. My wife, Angela, uh, we've been married 31 years. Um, she's the best thing that happened to me since Jesus. Amen? <laughs> so we're having a lot of fun. All right. Well, let me pray, and then let's jump in. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Father, right now, I just pray in the power and the name of Jesus that you will capture our hearts. Father, capture our hearts. Break our hearts. Father, I pray that you will be worshipped, that you will be glorified, that you will be magnified. Father, I pray that your kingdom purpose will be accomplished. Lord, you are the almighty God. You're the God of creation. You're the God of redemption. You're the God of restoration. And Lord, you are the God of salvation. Father, thank you for saving us. Thank you for adopting us to be joint heirs with Jesus. Father, that's an incredible privilege. And Lord, as you've called us to yourself, you are calling and sending us out. Father, just like a military operation, we're all expendable for the sake of your kingdom. So, Father, help us to be on mission with you and for you, filled by your spirit, walking in your power. Father, we have nothing to offer you but ourselves. But, Father, thank you that you, being the Almighty God, can use us in incredible ways to advance your kingdom, to fulfill your purpose. So, Father, I pray today that if there's anyone here who has never surrendered to Jesus as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of surrender and salvation. Father, for all of us who know you, may we grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus as Savior and Lord. Father, may you be glorified. I pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name, for his glory, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to talk about lifestyle evangelism, and I'm going to put up a, a, an idea here. Life is a mission trip. Say that with me. Life is a mission trip. A lot of times we think about going to... Uh, Alaska or going to New England or, or going somewhere overseas as being on a mission trip. We think of Vacation Bible School. Uh, in a lot of ways, you've got Judgment House coming up and you've got a mission trip coming to your campus. So be ready and be praying and pre pray every day. Um, your pastor told me an incredible story about a group of Methodist people, and I'm not picking on Methodists. Um, <laughs> I mean, I tell people I'm a Christian by conviction, a Baptist by choice, but I've been in about everything as I've moved around. But he said that uh, he had a group he was counseling for Judgment House. 
And he said, how many of y'all have uh, know that you need to pray and ask Christ into your heart? And they all raised their hand. He said, wait a minute, let me re-explain that. I'm not sure you understood what I was saying. So he re-explained the gospel presentation to him and said, now how many of y'all need to accept Christ in your, as your Lord and Savior? And they all raised their hand again. And, and, and my point of that is, you're going to have a lot of people come to Judgment House who have been churched, but they have never been confronted with the truth, the clearness of the gospel. And this is going to be the first time they're going to clearly hear the gospel and realize they've got to respond to it. So keep in mind that we're on mission as we do that. I'm going to leave this up because I want to tell you a funny story. I live in a neighborhood about halfway between Raleigh and Fuquay. I live just on this side of Fuquay. We've been there almost 20 years. When we first moved into our neighborhood, we got to know all of our neighbors. Um, surveyed the neighborhood. My oldest son for his RA mission project surveyed all of our neighbors and asked them, do you go to church? And we found out, and there's 34 homes in our development, 34 homes. Found out that only nine families went to church on a regular basis. So we realized right away our, mission, our neighborhood was a mission field. Now, we began to pray, get to know our neighbors. Ten years later, my younger son resurveyed the neighborhood and gave out a DVD that Nam actually made uh, about one of my neighbors. He's retired um, Army Sergeant, E7, and I had the privilege of baptizing him, and they did, Nam did a, did a video on him. So he gave it out to all of our neighbors, asked them, do, do you go to church? And I uh, found out that 17 families went to church on a regular basis. So over a period of time, we saw God do some things in our neighborhood. But here's the thing you got to hear. It was more about prayer than it was about anything else. I mean, we were engaged and we were sowing seeds. We were doing different outreaches, especially at Christmas and different times. But it was more an answer to prayer. And so just be aware of that, uh, the power of prayer to change people's hearts. You and I can't change them. Only God can change them through His Holy Spirit. Amen? So keep that in mind. We're not really the evangelist. God is the evangelist through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the things I do is I jog a couple of days a week and I pray for my neighbors. You've heard of people committing drive-by slayings. I want to encourage you to commit drive-by prayings. Amen? <laughs> You know, even if you're not walking or jogging, you could be, you could be driving. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that are prayer prompts. And, and we just kind of, we go the same routes every day. I mean, you go up and down Buffalo Lakes Road. You go up and down Ray Road. You go up and down 87, 24. And you just get used to the same stuff. But I want to I challenge you today. Ask God to open your spiritual eyes. And ask God to, to show you things that you don't normally see. Here's an example. This happened to you today. You were coming to church, and you passed by somebody's house. You may or may not know them. They've got cars in the driveway and toys in the yard. And when you get back home, there'll still be cars in the driveway and toys in the yard. There's two things you already know about that family. What do you know about them? They have kids, and they don't go to church. So automatically, it gives you something you can pray for. I just look for those prayer prompts. When you pass over Hills High School this direction, I'm thinking where I'm at, um, pray for the school. Pray for the teachers. Pray for those that know the Lord to be bold and winsome and have favor in sharing their faith. And those that don't know the Lord, their hearts will be open to it. And, I, and obviously, this is a patriotic group. When you see an American flag, pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. Pray for our president. Pray for our uh, military, for sure. And so I know you all do that. But th just let those things be prayer prompts. Now, I'm jogging along in my neighborhood, and i got to tell you a funny story, because I'm going to tell you a story about my garbage man. But let me set it up better. There's this little girl, and she and her grandmother were memorizing the Lord's Prayer. And Grandma is really pumped up because this little girl has got it word perfect. And she knows they're going to take the kids to church and all the little kids are going to line up and do the Lord's Prayer. So they're driving to church. A little girl looks over at Grandma and says, Grandma, you and God have a lot in common. She began to polish her spiritual halo. She said, what's that, honey? She said, you're both real old. <laughs> so they get to church and they line the kids up in the front. And they're going to do the Lord's Prayer. And the first little boy starts off and he says, Our Father who does art in heaven, Halloween be his name. He doesn't get it right, but he's funny. Well, the little girl, she's next, and she's word perfect till she gets to the part where she says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Well, that's not what she said, but her theology was good. She said, forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those that put trash in our baskets. <laughs> and I like that. I like that. And then she said, deliver up from email. <laughs> but taking her idea, forgive us our trash baskets. Jesus is the greatest garbage man of all time. Amen. Now, back to my jog, and I was jogging in the neighborhood one morning. I saw a garbage man. I had his name tag on. I said, T.C. I said, T.C., good morning. He said, good morning. I said, T.C., does that stand for terrific Christian? No, nah, man, no, nah, but it should. I said, well, T.C., let me ask you something. You know the greatest garbage man of all time is? And he goes, man, I never thought about it. That's a great question. Explain that to me. I said, well, it's Jesus Christ. I said, but you come each week, and you take away our garbage and our trash, and you take it away, and we don't have to see it or deal with it again, and I appreciate that. He said, well, you're welcome. I said, but in the same way, Jesus can come into our life and take away the garbage and the trash and the sin, and He can remove it so we don't have to see it or deal with it again. 
He said, that's good. That's real good. I need to tell other people that. I said, that's what I want you to do. I want you to tell other people that. Now, I'm jogging a few months later, and I see that we have a new garbage man. Now, all of you as Christians have been in this situation before. It wasn't your garbage man, but you're having that internal conversation in your head. And, and one side of your brain saying, man, if I start talking to them about Jesus or invite them to church or give them a gospel track or something, they're going to think I'm crazy. They're, they're not going to understand what I'm trying to do. So one half of your brain's telling you they're going to think I'm crazy, they're going to reject me. The other half of your brain's saying I ought to do it, I need to do it, I should do it. And so you don't do anything a lot of times. Well, I jogged on by my garbage man. I didn't say anything to him. He didn't really see me. So when I came back up the hill, we're face to face. And I said, good morning. He said, good morning. And he, he was Hispanic. He looked like he might be Hispanic. And I was already wondering if he would understand or speak English. I wasn't sure. And uh, right away, I said, what's your name? He said, my name's Rich. I said, my name's Marty. Nice to meet you, Rich. Where are you from? He said, originally, I'm from Puerto Rico, but I moved here from New York City. Obviously, he spoke English pretty well. And I said, Rich, let me ask you, do you know who the greatest garbage man of all time is? And he just stared at me like, he didn't say a word. He just stared at me like, what, you know, what kind of question is that? And I'm thinking already in the back of my mind, Lord, I don't think this is working. I said, it's uh, Jesus Christ. He's the greatest garbage man of all time. And he's kind of nodding his head like, what planet did you just get off of? And, and I'm already thinking, oh, man, that didn't work. That was a complete bust. And so I said, well, man, I hope that encourages you. Maybe I'll see you again sometime. He still didn't say a word, just nodded his head like, okay, you're a loony. So anyway, I jogged on thinking that did not work at all. So the next week, he drives in the neighborhood. He sees me. He stops the truck. It kind of spooked me a little bit, Mike. He, he stops the truck and jumps out and jerks his glove off and stuck his hand out and said, man, I just want to tell you, thank you for what you said to me last week. Nobody's ever said anything like that to me before. I was thinking, man, by the look on your face, I know that nobody ever said that before. <laughs> but we struck up a friendship, and we got to know each other, and we began to talk and Found out he had a Catholic background. We talked about that. Uh, the movie The Passion of the Christ had come out. We talked about Easter. Uh, he told me one day his little boy's name was Stephen. I said, Stephen? I said, that means crowned one. Have you ever read about Stephen in the Bible? He said, no, where is it? I said, it's at the end of Acts chapter 6, going to 7. He was the first martyr. Really? I got to look that up. So one day I'm at school and I'm signing up my daughter Darcy for school and I'm looking at this guy. I'm thinking, this is my garbage man. He raises up. It's my garbage man, Rich. He goes, Marty, what are you doing here? I said, my daughter Darcy, she goes to school here. He said, what are you doing here? He said, my son Stephen, he's getting ready to start the first grade. And, I, and I, he stands up and goes, I clean up pretty good, don't I? I said, man, you look nice. He was all dressed up. Introduced his wife. And Stephen's a little boy. And I got on my knees and said, you must be Stephen. And his eyes got huge. He didn't know I knew his name. <laughs> now, why don't I take the time to tell you the story about my garbage man? If they're true stories. Here's the reason. Each one of us, every one of us, you've got people in the natural path of your life, whether it's at Food Line or it's somewhere you go, it's on the sports field, it's at some club you're a part of, whatever it is you go to, you got people, you see them once a week or once a month, you have three to five minute conversations with them. Uh, you talk to them about the weather, it's great today, or you talk to them about the ball game last night, or you talked about what's going on in the news. Nothing wrong with that. But I want to challenge you and I want to encourage you today. Take these daily conversations, turn them into spiritual conversations, talk about Jesus. We live in a world that's not interested in church, but they are very interested in Jesus. They want to know about the Bible. They want to know about the Lord. And by the way, I didn't tell you this, but the message today is really more of a training message, more teaching than preaching, but I'll get to that. Uh, but I just wanted you to be aware of that because we're talking about having a lifestyle of evangelism. So I am going to tell a lot of stories, a lot of illustrations. But one of the things that we're always wanting to do is find out how to connect with somebody. And, and this is just a fun way. How many of y'all have a name in the Bible? Your name's in the Bible. Raise your hand. All right, Michael means who is like God. It's a question. What's your name right here on the front row, gray shirt? Ethan. I cannot remember what Ethan means, but it has something to do with God. What's your name on the far right? Joshua. Joshua. God is salvation. My oldest son is named Joshua. He goes by his middle name, but they just named their son JT. It's going to be Joshua Talat Dupree. That's a great name. Joshua is a great military commander in the Bible. Yes, sir. Elijah. Elijah. That means my God is God. Eli means my God, and the J-A-H is from Yahweh. It means my God is God, Elijah. That's pretty cool. Yes, sir. Emmanuel, Emmanuel God with us. Yes, ma'am. Sarah means princess. You're a princess. Your parents probably already told you that. Yes, sir, in the back. Benjamin means son of the right hand. Right here, little man right here. You just put your hand on him. Benjamin, son of the right hand. All right, anybody, anybody, one more. Nevaeh, I cannot remember what it means, but it has to do with life. Has something to do with life. Uh, what's that? That's it, heaven spelled backwards. You should have told me that. This, she's a very outstanding young lady. She introduced herself to me, and I, I remembered her. She's 
Very good. Somebody over here. Zachary. Zachary means God remembers. It's from Zachariah. Now, I tell you this, not because you need to know what name, all the names mean, but if you know the names in the Bible, this is a great conversation starter. You can say, hey, your name's in the Bible. Have you ever read about yourself in the Bible? Let me give you an example. I was in a restaurant outside of, right in Cary uh, one time. It was uh, on the border. Big old tall guy, college age. He was our waiter. His name was Daniel. I said, Daniel. I said, you know what your name means? He said, no. I said, it means God is my judge. He goes, really? I said, yeah. I said, have you ever read about yourself in the Bible? No, I hadn't read the Bible. And I said, man, you need to read about Daniel. He's got these three friends named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I mean, they get thrown in a fire. They're like walking around the fire. They don't even get burned. They don't even smell like smoke. He's looking at me like, really, what? I'm like, no, that's all in the Bible. Let him make it up. He's just kind of looking at me. And I said, and then Daniel, he gets thrown in the lion's den. The lions lay down and go to sleep. They don't even bother him. And he gets out when they go to get him out. The lions eat the guys that threw him in. He goes, really? I said, yeah, it's all in the Bible. I said, that's just the first half of Daniel. The second half is about end times and the second coming. He goes, really? I said, yeah, you might have to read by Sarah from the Bible. He said, I guess I'll have to do that. Now, I did not mention God. I didn't preach Jesus to him. I didn't share a gospel presentation with him. But I engaged him in a fun kind of creative way with his name. And you've got to know that guy went home thinking, I probably need to read Daniel in the Bible. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> And so a lot of times we're not necessarily presenting a gospel presentation, but we're moving people towards, towards God. We're moving towards the cross. So you take it as far as you can in those things, and you look for connecting points. People ask me all the time, what's your secret sauce? I mean, how do you connect with people? My two favorite questions, what's your name? Where are you from? And you can go a long way with a lot of those. But my transitional question, which I'll talk about that next time a little more, is do you have any particular spiritual beliefs? And then you just let them talk. You listen to their story, tell them your story, tell them his story, the three-story method. Say that with me. I'll teach that next time in detail, but say their story, my story, his story. Just remember that. And you can engage people in conversation, and it's easy to talk to them. And by the way, we do church a lot in, in America, traditional church, kind of like a man fishing in the middle of a lake without a fishing rod, yelling at the fish to jump in the boat. It's not impossible, but it's real unlikely. You know, it's like, y'all come, y'all come. There's a sign out front. Here's my card. People aren't coming. Here's the reason people don't come to church that have never been. For them just to walk in these doors, it's like you and I go down Ray Road and pick a house, somebody you don't know, and just walk in. You're not going to do that, right? You're not. But if you did, you'd be really uncomfortable. That's what it's like for somebody who's never been to church. Now, inviting people to church is one thing. Just saying, hey, come show up, they're probably not going to come. But if you invite them and walk in with them, they'll come in with you. They'll walk in with you. They'll come to Judgment House. So this is a great opportunity you have. I'm not really preaching on prayer, but last time I preached on why we should pray for and share with lost people. But you can't, I cannot emphasize enough the power of prayer and how important prayer is uh, in terms of evangelism and sharing the gospel. Now, being an all-mission Christian in your daily life. Now, let's talk about evangelism. A lot of times somebody says, we're going to do evangelism. So it's like we're going to go out and hit somebody in the head with a Bible. We're going to get them in a headlock and tell them where they go if they don't straighten out. We all know that's not the way to win friends and influence enemies. Amen? Um, the word evangelism literally means good news. Now, what's if porno works? Oh, yeah, it works. All right, see the word in the middle of the word is the word angel. And then right at the beginning of the word is EV. The word in Greek is euangelion. The EV is EU, and it means good. And then right in the middle is the word angel. Like, for example, when you go to a funeral and you hear a eulogy about somebody, that means a good word about them. In the same way, this means the good message or the good news. And true evangelism is an act of compassion, not an act of aggression. It's caring about a soul. And people pick up on that real quickly, whether you care about them or not, or whether you're trying to get something from them or do something to them or, or get them to agree to something. You know what I'm saying? So we've got to be compassionate. We've got to care about them. And, and we're really good newsing them. We've got to remember that. Some of y'all are familiar with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Y'all remember that in Acts chapter 8? Uh, the eunuch is bouncing along and he's reading Isaiah out loud. And the Spirit of the Lord tells Philip to run up to him. He said, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how could I unless somebody explains it to me? And the Bible says in Acts 8, 35, beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. But what it literally says is he uangaliized him. He evangelized him with Jesus. To put that in the most literal, he good newsed him with Jesus. And folks, we've got to recapture that, that evangelism is good newsing people. It's not an act of uh, aggression. It's an act of compassion. Now, let me tell you a story about kind of what this looks like. Y'all all know when you start to talk to somebody, you're talking about whatever, and all of a sudden you start talking about something spiritual, people tend to kind of back up, and they're kind of waiting to see, are you going to preach to me or tell me where I'm going to go if I don't straighten out? 
Well, illustration of that. I coach sports. I've been coaching baseball for 20 years. I can't wait for baseball season. I love it. I was at the football game Friday night thinking, I can't wait to be back out here for baseball. But um, I was coming off the baseball field on a Saturday, right after practice, it was about lunchtime. This homeless guy came up to me. Now, he was a young guy. His name was Michael. As it turns out, he's 19 years old. And he said, hey, man, can you give me some money to get something to drink? Well, you don't give homeless people money to get something to drink. I said, when's the last time you had something to eat? He said, well, it's been a while. I said, well, my son and I, we're going to get some lunch. Why don't you go with us? He goes, all right. My son said, let's go to Arby's. He said, Arby's would be good. <laughs> so I put him in the car with me. I go through the drive through at Arby's because I wanted to keep him in the car as long as I couldn't talk to him. And I, I started witness to him. He goes, oh, man, I don't believe all that. He said, I heard all that in the homeless shelter. I said, why don't you believe it? He said, uh, because there's a bunch of hypocrites in church. I said, well, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of hypocrites in church. But there's also a lot of hypocrites everywhere. And not just in church, there's hypocrites everywhere. You know what I'm saying? We should have a bumper sticker that says, you know, motorcycles are everywhere. We have one that says hypocrites are everywhere. They are. And so if people say stuff and you can agree with it, just agree and then move on. But don't argue because that's not what you're trying to do. So we talked for a little bit, asked him a little, a few questions. I said, well, Michael, before you go, can I pray for you? Looks at me kind of odd and goes, I guess so. So I pray for him. He gets out of the car. He stands there for just a minute. Then he sits back down in the car. Then he lets me share with him. And as he got out and, he, and we were driving away, my son said, Dad, why did he get back in the car? I said, I think he figured out. We weren't trying to do anything to him. We weren't trying to get anything from him. We weren't judging him. Uh, we were just trying to tell him about Jesus. And on top of that, we bought his lunch. But you see the process that's going on there? People are backing away from you until they realize you're genuinely concerned about them, but you're not making them feel bad. People already feel bad. They already kind of know they're not right. We're all broken. And uh, we'll talk more about that next time. And, and we can't fix each other. Only, only the gospel of Jesus Christ, the perfect Jesus, can fix us. So keep that in mind that true evangelism is an act of compassion, not an act of aggression. Here's another principle, too. We, by nature, tend to see people as either scenery or machinery. And we need to see them as a soul with an eternal destiny. This changes our whole perspective on how we deal with people. We tend to see scenery. You know, what do they look like? Are they tall? Are they short? Do they have blue hair? Do they have spiked hair? Do they have earrings? Do they have tattoos? Or what color are they? And we tend to kind of lock in on the physical. That's our human nature. Or we see them as machinery. What can they do or how good are they? And we've got to change that question. The question isn't what, can, what do they look like or what can they do? The question is, what's the condition of their heart? And do they know Jesus as their Savior? And that takes a whole different angle on how we're going to deal with people. Um, some of y'all are familiar with a song by Brandon Heath. It's a, actually a prayer. It's called, Lord, Give Me Your Eyes. And in that song, he's asking God to help him to see people as God sees them. And folks, we got to do that. we got to ask God to help us to see people as he sees them, from the inside out, not just from the outside in. Now, this applies not just in being judgmental, but it also applies in terms of how we do evangelism. Because a lot of times we'll see somebody and we'll just say, well, they don't really want to hear what I have to say. And you have no idea whether they want to hear it because you didn't try um, or we'll say, man, that person is so far from God, they, they will never come back to God. Well, let me give you a couple illustrations. Because we don't see what God sees. Y'all remember King David? What was David before he was a king? He's a shepherd boy. All right, well, Jesse had a whole lot of sons, and Saul wasn't doing good as king, so Samuel was going to replace Saul as king. So he told Jesse, bring in all your sons. And he goes, nope, he's not the one, nope, he's not the one, nope, he's not the one. Don't you have another son? He goes, oh, yeah, I got David. He's a shepherd boy. He's out the sheep. He said, well, bring him in. He goes, He's the one. He's God's anointed. See, everybody saw David as a shepherd boy, but God saw him as a king. And folks, we got to remember that, that when God transforms somebody's life, there's no telling what he can do with them. Amen? Now, I'm going to tell a story that some of you, the older you are, the more likely you'll know the story. But back in the 1920s, there was a great evangelist named Mordecai Ham. And he preached all over the country. He was well known. He was preaching outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, two-week tent revival. And on one particular night, Saturday night, one of his friends asked him, so how'd it go? He said, well, it wasn't that big a night. We just had one teenage boy saved. Well, that one teenage boy was a 17-year-old son of a dairy farmer named Billy Graham. And you all know who Billy Graham is. Well, actually, his, um, his grandson's preaching at Calvary Baptist on 27 this morning. I was there with him last night. And he, you know, he made a statement. He's preached to more people than anybody in history. Um, but he said, to me, he's just my granddad. Um, but the thing about it is, that's a good point. He's just a normal man that God chose to use in an incredible way. He's the son of a dairy farmer. Whose son are you? It doesn't matter because when God transforms your heart, he becomes your heavenly father, and he's the one that determines what you're going to do and what's going to happen with you. Man, I could go on and on talking about my kids. Uh, four of my five kids have learning challenges. They've had a lot to overcome. Uh, I'll just tell you this. 
um, in the second grade, when my son was in the second grade, uh, a lady that was doing an evaluation said, he probably um, needs to get a trade because he'll never go to college. And um, he just got out of the Army as a company commander. Uh, he went to college on a scholarship. So God has the last word on everything. Amen. God has the last word on everything. Don't let anybody tell you anything that's negative. God has the last word. Uh, so just look to God. That's, that's an aside. That's another message for another day. But um, anyway, um, keep that in mind, that, that we evaluate ourselves based on our ability, but we got to remember we got to evaluate our evangelism based on God's ability. Because through the power of the Holy Spirit, He can do anything He wants to. Amen? There's a lot more we can say about that. I need to move on. All right. Uh, look at this, uh, this uh, principle here, too. Chuck Kelly just announced his retirement. Uh, he made this statement that Southern Baptists are a harvest-minded denomination living in an unseated generation. I heard him speak on this a couple of times, and I heard him also say he's worried that we're not as harvest-minded as we used to be. And being harvest-minded is a good thing. And, and what that means is we want to see people saved. We want to see people come to know Jesus. We want to see people walk the aisles, join the church, be baptized. That's harvest-minded. That's why you're doing Judgment House. That's a harvest event. But we're living in an unseated generation. Now, a lot of times with being harvest-minded, one of the drawbacks is it's kind of like this. It's kind of like if this is the cross, some people are right here. They're ready to be harvested when you ask them. Are you ready to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? They'll come to Christ. But in our culture, more people need to be cultivated. They need to get their questions answered. I mean, the teaching or the preaching of the gospel, far more people need the seed sown. They need to know you love them, you're praying for them, you've invited them to church, you've given them a Bible. So whether we're sowing or cultivating or harvesting, all that's an equally important part of that process of bringing people to Christ. A lot of our focus is on getting people saved. And now the, the drawback on that is a lot of times we leave that to the preacher, the evangelist, the missionary, the youth pastor, and we just kind of dismiss ourselves from it. The reality is, is God has called all of us to be a part of that process in people's lives of sowing and cultivating and harvesting as we move them towards the cross. Amen? And so keep that in mind that we're all a part of that process. And, and you never know when you are. I was, I was coming out of a parking deck in Raleigh one time, and there's these two young girls, probably 18, 19, 20 years old. they just droopy. They look like they are hungover from the night before or lost their best friend or just didn't sleep enough. I don't know. My old pastor growing up would have called it sad dancing and slow singing. <laughs> All I was going to do was sow a seed. I was just going to give her a Bible verse card out of my pocket. I always carry cards that have got different things on them uh, just to give people to, as a way of sowing a seed. So I was just going to sow a seed. But she came to the window, and I was getting ready to give her a ticket. Her name tag was on. It's kind of wacky job. And it said Angie. I said, Angie, is that short for Angela? She goes, yeah, that's my real name. I said, Angela, that's my wife's name. Do you know what it means? No, what's it mean? I said, it means an angel or a messenger. Man, you thought I plugged her in an electric socket. She, she uh, elbows. She says, Deidre, did you hear that? I'm an angel. I'm a messenger. It just came to life. And so I handed her a card. I said, here's a card. It's got a Bible verse and a prayer on it. I hope it encourages you today. She put her hands on her hips and cocked her head sideways. She said, somebody's trying to say something to me. Well, folks, when God's at work, you don't have to kick the door down. I said, well, who's trying to say something to you? She pointed up like that. I said, do you want to talk about that? And she said, yes, sir, but you probably don't have time. And I said, well, ma'am, let me back in and I'll come back around. When I came back around, she looked at me. And she said, sir, you're the third person in 24 hours to say something to me about the Lord. I heard the Twilight Zone music then. And I, do, 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 do. Okay, God, you're up some. She said, the first person left me this little booklet, Our Daily Bread. I noticed y'all have some on a table out there. First person left me this little booklet, Our Daily Bread. He said, the next person left me this little booklet. It says, do you know for certain that you have eternal life and you'll go to heaven when you die? I said, can I see that a minute? Stamped on the back, North Raleigh, um, um, Mount Vernon Baptist Church in North Raleigh. I said, can I share this with you? Oh, yeah. DJ, you need to hear as much as I do. Sir, she needs to hear as much as I do, but you can run the cash right out, but you don't need me. Very animated. She gets more animated as it goes on. And so I started going through the booklet. You know, number one, God loves you. has a plan for you, John 3, 16. God loved everybody. The second principle is we've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. When I got to the third principle about Jesus being God's only provision and payment for our sin, she starts weeping. I said, are you all right? Oh, I got some stuff in my life. And she told me. I was like, wow, appreciate your honesty. There's a lot of honesty. And... Um, <laughs> And I, she said, but go on, I want to hear that. I said, well, the fourth thing is, John 1, 12 says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And, and um, I, so I, I said, went to the prayer. You know, there's a sinner's prayer, prayer of repentance. I read the prayer to her. I said, Angie, is this what's on your heart? Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. She's still gently weeping. I said, uh, is this what you need to pray? Is this what you need to do? Oh, yes, sir. I said, all right. Well, are you ready to pray right now? Oh, no, I can't pray right now. I've got to do all this stuff in my life. I said, oh, Angie, I said, you don't have to clean up. 
before you come to God. I said, when you surrender your heart to him, he will clean you up. I said, let me tell you my story. I said, there was a time that I was like you. I was 18 inches away from heaven. In my head, just like you, I agreed. I knew what I needed to do with Jesus. But in my heart, I'd not surrendered. And I said, I was, I was 13 years old. It was two days before I started eighth grade. I would started reading the Bible. I was under conviction. I felt like an elephant was sitting on me. Just that pressure that I had to do something. I said, so my mom made an appointment with the pastor. He went through the four spiritual laws with me. Number one, Marty, you know God loves you. He has a plan for your life. Yes, sir. John 3, 16. Yes, sir. Do you know you're a sinner and your sin separates you from God? Yes, sir. Do you know that Jesus is the only payment for your sin? John 14, 6. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Yes, sir. Do you know you need to receive him into your life, into your heart? Yes, sir. Are you ready to pray? Yes, sir. I said, but Angie, the pastor said something to me that was so profound it changed my life. I said, the next thing he said to me, after I prayed with him and agreed with him about my situation, my status, and what I needed to do, he said this to me. He said, now, Marty, I want you to go home, pray your own prayer in your own words, and surrender your life. See, I, I had it all in my head, but I had not surrendered in my heart. Because when I went home that night, even after that conversation with the pastor, I still feel like an elephant sitting on me because I had not surrendered my life. And that night, I really did pray, and I really did surrender my life to the Lord, and I felt like I floated off the bed. Now, I, I didn't float at all. I was laying flat on my back. But I had such a relief, and then I had this kind of warm, confident feeling that I now realize was God's Spirit coming in my life, and that happened 40-some years ago, and I've never gotten over it, and that's why I was telling Angie about it. That's why I'm telling you about it. Have you ever really surrendered? Yeah, hey, praise the Lord. I mean, it changed my life. And I mean, I hadn't been perfect since then, but I mean, the ups and downs, I've always known at that moment that God saved me, that God reached into my life and did something that transformed my life, which will never be the same again. And as I was sharing that with Angie, she's still gently weeping. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I said, Angie, can I pray for you? Oh, please pray for me. So I prayed that God would forgive her. He'd cleanse her. He'd set her free. He'd make her his own. In Jesus' name. Amen. And she said, thank you, sir. Thank you. I needed that. And as I was walking the way, the Holy Spirit just gave me a question to ask her. It was really a statement. I said, Angie, I hope I'll see you in heaven someday. And she said, you will, sir. You will. But folks, we got Angie's in our life every day. They're divine appointments. And they're people that we don't know where they are, if we're sowing or cultivating, harvesting. They're somewhere in that process. And as we step into their life, God's bringing us in almost like an angel. We don't know that. We don't know where they are in the process. But as we begin to talk about spiritual things, you'll realize they want to talk about that. They're open to that. And God's dealing with them. And so when I said that question to her, I hope I'll see you in heaven someday. I wasn't falsely committing her to heaven. I wasn't condemning her to hell. I was leaving her with a question that she had to answer herself. But it was a hopeful question. So that's just a, a good thing to think about. But keep in mind, sometimes we're sowing, sometimes we're cultivating, sometimes we're harvesting. Bill Fay has a study called Share Jesus Without Fear. I think you all have done that here. Um, I know Ronnie's aware of it, but it's using the New Testament and using Roman Road. He's reading the Bible to people, have them read it. But he talks about there might be 27 people involved in this one person coming to Christ. And when you engage with them, you don't know if you're 1 or 10 or 15 or 27, but either way, you're moving them towards the cross. Amen? So just keep that in mind, that we're in an unseated generation. Look at this definition of successful witnessing. Daryl Robinson, who used to be head of evangelism for the Home Mission Board before it was the North American Mission Board, he made this statement. He said, any witness given of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, leaving the results to God, is a successful witness. Amen? Amen. See, it's the, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not us. Acts 1.8 said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, which is cross-cultural, and then the rest of the world. And so, see, we're not the evangelist. God is the evangelist through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're the messenger. We're the mouthpiece. We're the vessels. And God can use that. I want to back up for just a second and talk about an unseated generation. Folks, we live in a day and a time and a culture when most people don't go to church and have never been to church. Here in Harnett County, uh, just by, by census numbers, and it's true all throughout North Carolina, 67% of the people in North Carolina have zero connection to any church of any denomination. Only one-third of the county, one-third of the state has some kind of connection to a church. Now, out of that one-third, we're talking about three million people roughly. Less than half of them ever go to church. So out of the, out of the 10 million people in North Carolina, only one and a half million people go to church at least once or twice a year. So when you, when you bring that down, you're down to less than a million people who actually have a personal relationship with Jesus. So it's more like one out of ten. So we're, we're in a lost world. We're in an unseated generation. Let me illustrate how true that is. I went into like a, an Altel store or Verizon store to get a headset for my phone one day. Eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, guy's in there, young guy named Brian, reading a book. He's the only guy in the store early in the morning. 
And he's just reading a book. He lays his book down as I walk in, and we start talking. Brian, how you doing? Fine. Where are you from? I'm from Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. It's about an hour east of Raleigh. I said, where did you go to school? He said, East Carolina University. Now, this is a Joe College, next-door neighbor, 25-year-old, your next-door neighbor kind of guy, just a normal North Carolina boy. And I said, so I don't normally even ask this question, but I said to him, I said, well, Brian, do you have a church background? He looked at me and goes, no, sir, I've never been to church. I thought to myself, you're a North Carolina boy, went to East Carolina, grew up in Rocky Mountain, you've never been to church. And I said, what about weddings or funerals? He said this, none of my friends are married yet, none of my friends have died. I've never been to church. So then I asked myself a question. Okay, Mr. Evangelism, dude, now what do you say? <laughs> so I asked him my favorite question. I said, well, Brian, do you ever think about spiritual things? He raised his eyebrows, he reaches under the counter, and he holds up the book he was reading, and he just shows it to me. The title of the book was Bible Basics for Dummies. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I heard the Twilight Zone music again. You know, God, you're up to something here. And uh, he did not go to a Christian bookstore and get that book. He went to Barnes & Noble or Books a Million or wherever books are sold. And right beside Computer Basics for Dummies was Bible Basics for Dummies. That's what he pulled off the shelf, and that's what he was reading when I walked in. So then I asked him, I said, well, Brian, have you ever heard of Billy Graham? He said, yes, sir. Everybody in North Carolina has heard of Billy Graham. I, I thought to myself, au contraire, mon frere, most people under 30 have not heard of Billy Graham, but I'm glad you have. So I pulled out one of my favorite little Bible studies. By the way, I don't ever call them tracts or pamphlets. If you give somebody a booklet and you call it a track or a pamphlet, it just sounds so cultic. I just say, here's a Bible study you can take a look at. And this is my favorite one. It's called Steps of Peace with God. I put some on the table out there. But most of you will be familiar with the part of it. It's kind of like it shows if this is God, it shows how man is trying to reach God in all kinds of different ways. Try, we try to reach God through being good, being religious, going to church, having good morals, doing good works, and how all of those things fall short and how God sends Jesus and the cross is the bridge from God to man. It's through the cross of Christ that we have a relationship and access to God. And so, yeah, I explained it to him. I went right through it. He was very open. He didn't argue. He wasn't defensive. It wasn't nervous. It was very comfortable. And I said, uh, have you ever seen anything like that? He goes, no, nobody's really ever shared anything like that with me. I said, well, I noticed that you're reading a book about the Bible. My, my encouragement to you is to read the Bible for itself. Just start in the New Testament and read straight through. He said, yeah, I'm going to need to do that. Now, he didn't pray to receive Christ. He's never been to church. He's never heard the gospel. That was the first time. But he was curious because he was reading about it. And folks, people are like that everywhere we go. Now, they're not going to come to church necessarily, but they'll sit with you at McDonald's at the traffic circle and talk for an hour or coffee shops or wherever it is. You run into a young person, just ask them, hey, you got any particular spiritual beliefs? And let them talk. And then hopefully, the best scenario, they'll ask you, what, you, what do you believe? And you get to tell them. But just build a relationship conversation. I'm not talking about waiting months and years to talk to them. I'm talking about in the first time you talk to them, sow some seeds, talk to them about Jesus, encourage them to read the Bible for themselves. Amen? Not that hard to do. Just keep it in mind. Now, we've, we've looked at a lot of principles. Now we need to get into some scripture here. And uh, we don't have a lot of time. Oh my goodness, I didn't know what time it was. But I want to hit some highlights here because this is important. Now, let me give the background and we'll just hit the highlights in this scripture. The background is this is Easter Sunday morning. Jesus has just been crucified. He's been put in a borrowed tomb. An earthquake takes place, rolls away the stone. The angel appears to the soldiers. They fall out like dead men. And then we pick it up in verse 5. You've got all these ladies named Mary. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James. They all show up at the grave to do the final burial stuff. And an angel appears to them, scares them to death. And the angel says to them in verse 5, it says, Fear not, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. Now, folks, I think they must learn that in angel school on the first day. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Isn't that what they say? It's because when you come to the presence of the divine being, it's going to scare you to death. That's exactly why. But look at this statement. I know you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. And it goes on and said, he's not here. He's risen. Come and see the place where he was lying. But I want to pull that phrase out for a minute. I know you are looking for Jesus. Folks, everybody is ultimately looking for Jesus. They may not say that. They may not use those words. I know the Bible says there's none righteous. There's not even one. There's no one who seeks after God. That's Romans quoting from Isaiah and from the Old Testament. But when people begin to think about God and begin to wonder if there's a God and begin to try to think about how do I get to know God, they're looking for Jesus. Uh, um, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God has set eternity in the heart of every human being. So every human being has a sense there's something out there, something beyond them. Uh, we were in a Chili's restaurant. My wife needs a break today other than McDonald's, amen, with five kids. And uh, we had this waitress, and she's had an attitude. 
You know when somebody has an attitude? We had a guy from uh, uh, Fuquay one t- or from uh, Fayetteville one time. His name was Elijah, and I asked him, could he call down fire and cook? And uh, he, he thought that was funny. He was a believer. But we had this waitress named N- Nikki, and she just, you know, she just looked like she'd rather not be at work that day. And she comes up to her table and had her name tag. I said, Nikki. I said, Nikki, is that short for Nicole? Yeah. I said, you know what it means? Yeah. I mean, it's a victorious one, like Nike. And she goes, yeah, I know, I know. My grandmother gave me a card. I mean, she just had an attitude. So I said to her, not anything about church, but I said, Nikki, have you ever seen the movie The Passion of the Christ? It was around Easter time. And when I ask her that question, she puts her hands up and backs up and goes, oh, um, I'm not religious. I don't go to church or anything. I said, well, I'm religious. I, I brush my teeth twice a day. And she said, <laughs> she said, no, you're sarcastic. And I'm thinking to myself, no, girl, you're sarcastic. I didn't say that to her, but I said that to my wife. I said, that's the pot calling the kettle black. But I said, no, I'm not talking about being religious or going to church. I'm just talking about what Jesus said and what he did on the cross. And she kind of steps back up the table and goes, oh, I'm interested in that. The cook, we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. Now, when you unwind my story, when I mention something spiritual, in this case it was a movie, her response was, I'm not religious, I don't go to church. But when I said, I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about relationships, she said, oh, I'm interested in that. So keep that in mind. People aren't really looking for religion. They're looking for relationship. So they are looking for Jesus. Now, he's been crucified. He's not here. Uh, come and see the place where he's lying. Look at verse uh, 7. If you got your Bible, we're in Matthew 28, verse 7. He said, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. Behold, I've told you. Now, keep in mind, this is the angels telling the ladies that he's going before you into Galilee. And notice that statement, going before you. There is nothing that God has called this church to do, called your family to do, or called you individually to do. He has not already gone before you. Every story and illustration I've shared today, God had already set it up. I call it stepping into God's stuff. God's at work everywhere. We're just stepping into God's stuff. We're just kind of joining Him where He's already doing something in somebody's life or situation. And then He goes on in in verse 8. It says, They left the tomb with fear and great joy. They ran to report this to the disciples. And um, keep in mind, the angel is telling the the ladies and telling the disciples, Go to Galilee. You got to keep that in mind. The angels tell them, go to Galilee. Then in verse 8, they left with fear and great joy. They ran to report it to the disciples. Then verse 9, Jesus met them, greeted them. They took hold of his feet. They worshiped him. This probably happened on the road to Emmaus. Luke has the whole passage. Matthew just has these two verses. But in verse 10, Jesus says to them, kind of like the angels, fear not, do not be afraid. Go and take my word to my brethren to leave for Galilee. There they shall see me. Now here's something I want you to be sure you're getting this in your mind before we get there. Angel told them, Go to Galilee. Jesus is telling them, go to Galilee. There's something significant about to happen. Y'all know at the end of this is the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all the nations. He's going to send them out. But before he sends them out, I want you to see he's telling them, go to Galilee. So then you've got a little interlude here. I call this the Jewish conspiracy, verses 11 through 15. And what, what's going on there? Well, really, it kind of is. <laughs> Some of y'all are laughing. But um, they basically told the the soldiers, hey, just say you fell asleep and the disciples stole the body. We'll pay off the governor and that'll get you out of trouble. And then it goes on and says in verse 15, many of the Jews believe this to this day. What the Jews believe is the body was just stolen. But hey, here's the good news about the resurrection. It's not just a biblical fact. It's a historical fact. The, The Roman historians in the first century, the Romans are the one that crucified him. I know the Jews put him there, but the Romans did it. But the Roman historians like Eusebius and Josephus, they wrote about the resurrection as a historical fact. So that's established. Now, if you run into a Jewish person, just say, and you're a believer, say, hey, I'm Jewish too by adoption. Because you are. Um, Romans 11, and we won't go into all that, but the natural olive branch, and then you graft in the wild olive branch, and we accept the old covenant and the new covenant together. Jesus completes them. We're Jewish too by adoption. So you can have a lot of fun with that. Now, angel told him go to Galilee. Jesus told him to go to Galilee. Look what happens in verse 16 and 17. The eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. Now, think about this. Where are these guys from? They're from Galilee. Where did they first meet Jesus? Galilee. Where did they see him do the miracle with the fish and the loaves? Mountainside in Galilee. You know he's getting ready to send them to go make disciples of all the nations, but what's going on here? He's calling these guys back home. He's calling them back to himself. He's calling them back to where they first met him, where they saw him do miracles, right? Why do you think? And so they've got a motivation and a passion to go and tell others what they have seen and heard and experienced. 
And folks, that's what God is calling you and I to do on a daily basis is to share what we've seen and heard and experienced and know about Jesus. And if you haven't had some kind of experience with Jesus and you need to have an experience with Jesus because then you're going to be a little more excited about telling other people. Amen? Amen. And maybe you're here today and you've really not surrendered to Him. You might know about Him, but you need to surrender your life to Him and He's going to set you on a mission that's eternal, that matters every day. And so it's exciting to think about that. Some were doubtful, but they worshipped Him. Now, the part that's next, let me tell an illustration about this. We, we were getting ready to serve communion one day. I was pastoring in the Hickory area before I came to work with the Baptist State Convention, which I did that for a long time. Uh, but we were getting ready to serve communion. And I called on one of our deacons. His name was Dean. He was 38 years old, good man, really showed up for everything. I mean, you could just depend on him, very dependable. I said, Dean, before we serve the bread, why don't you pray for us? <clears throat> Get ready to serve communion. This was Dean's prayer. He goes, Lord, thank you for saving my sorry lost soul. We love you, Jesus. Amen. That's all he said. Man, I got a lump in my throat and tears in my eyes, and it was like rainfall. There wasn't a dry in the place. And as we were serving the bread, I thought, what touched me and touched everybody else? Well, nobody thought of Dean as sorry, and nobody thought of Dean as lost, but Dean remembered 18 years earlier when he was lost, and he thanked God for saving his sorry lost soul. And folks, if we're honest, we could say and pray the same thing. Amen? Amen. It's a gracious act of God that He would save us, adopt us, and make us join heirs with Jesus. We, we forget that. And so I think this is what's going on in this passage. In some ways, Jesus is bringing these guys back home and back to Himself before He sends them out so that they're fully motivated. You know, it's good to have a pep talk at the, before the game or at halftime and before you go on a mission. Somebody gives you a talk. Well, Jesus is kind of giving them a, a come home message before He sends them out. And then the part you're familiar with. He said, all authority in the whole universe in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. This is God in the flesh speaking through Jesus. And then he gives them their mission. It's, it's called the great commission. It's not our mission, it's his mission. And he invites us, in fact, commands us to be a part of it. But it's really a call to a lifestyle. Because you've got one verb, make disciples, but you've got these three participles or adverbs. I'm not a good English person. It's their active. I know that uh, going is active, present, indicative. It means it keeps on going. It's not just one time. Go, make disciples, baptizing and teaching. But it literally, it's as you go. He's calling us to a lifestyle. It's as you go, make disciples. Say this with me. Life is a mission trip. You ready? Life is a mission trip. He's called us to be on mission. So what is a disciple? Well, this is my definition. A fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ who is reproducing fruit that remains. John 15, 8, Jesus said, you'll know you're my disciples if you bear much fruit. But here's a definition I really like. Uh, based on Matthew 4, 19. He says, go. He said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, you make a choice with your head, I will make you, I'll transform your heart, fishers of men. It's the head, the heart, and the hands. And I like this definition. Uh, Jim Putnam says, a disciple is a follower of Christ, being changed by Christ, and on the mission of Christ. And a lot of times we get the first two right as a believer, but we're really not on that last one. And I'm really encouraging and inviting you and praying for you today. Let's be on mission for Christ. Amen? Because that's really what he's calling us to. Now, last, last, verse, last two verses here. Go and make disciples of all the nations. That's people groups. In North Carolina, in the public school system, there's over 450 different language groups represented in the public school system in North Carolina. Whole world's come here. I mean, you go up to the corner, you, know, you got a, a Chinese restaurant right up here. I mean, there's Asians right there that have come here. So you've got people from all over the world right here. Go and make disciples, baptize them. This is my daughter, Darcy, this baptism when she was nine. She's 24 now. She's been in eight or nine different countries on mission trips. She's literally been all over the world. She's been in the Amazon. She's worked with Hungarian gypsies. She's worked with North African refugees. Had no idea when I baptized her all the places she'd go. And uh, there's a lot more to that story. But when we think baptism, y'all, we think ceremony. You've got a beautiful baptistry up here. And we think invite friends, grandma, everybody to the baptism ceremony. But I want to go back. Think about this not from a Western American lens, but what about a Buddhist? What about a Hindu? What about a Muslim? When they read this, it says, go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing. They realize baptism is a public expression of an inward decision experience. Now, for a Muslim, it may cost them their life. Maybe not just their life, maybe their whole family if they're baptized publicly. And so, folks, when you read this, don't always read it through a Western lens. Read it with a global-minded lens of how's the rest of the world seeing this. And what this really is, it's a call to live out loud our faith, even if it may cost us something. I'm not talking about being crazy and standing on street corners and doing crazy stuff. I'm just talking about living out your faith, and it may cost you something. 
And it does for a lot of people in the world. So just keep that in mind. We're called to be on mission as we go. And then the last part, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And then, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The word observe is actually a military word, we, where we get the word military observers. It means to obey. It means to, uh, to uh, listen, to observe, to teach, train, to observe all that I've suggested to you. No, all that I've commanded you. And then his promise Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I emphasize the I am because Jesus is saying, I, God, in the flesh are going to be with you when you do what it is I've asked you to do. Isn't that great? We're not on our own on this mission. It's his mission. We're just joining him in the mission he's asked us to. And so it's a lifestyle. Prayer's influence, just a couple of words. George Barna says that if we, that a community that strives to evangelize its community without saturating its efforts in prayer is like a race car driver that jumps into the starting line and discovers his tank has not fin been filled with gas. Isn't this how we do ministry a lot of times? We have plans, ideas, organization, but there may not be the Spirit of God in it. Folks, that's why we got to pray for the Spirit of God to fall on this place, to fall on this place this week and next week as you do Judgment House. And then prayer supernatural. Evelyn Christians has said, we failed to sufficiently God, involve God through prayer in our soul-winning efforts. In our pre-evangelism praying, we ask the all-powerful, the omnipotent God of the universe to reach down and work in people's lives before we do and what a difference such praying makes. See, we can have human conversations, but when we stop talking to each other and we start talking to God, we've stepped out of the human and the natural. We've stepped into the supernatural. Amen? Now, think about prayer as a strategy. When we went into Iraq the first time, we didn't just send ground troops in. We sent the Air Force planes and the Navy planes in, and we bombed the place. And we bombed the place for a long time, kind of softening the target before you send any ground troops in. Now, forget about the horrors of war for just a minute and think spiritually. If you want to reach the Overhills community, you want to saturate this place in prayer. So when you begin to start talking to people and you do go door to door and you do reach out, the hearts have already been softened. They're a little more open to, to it. The prayer force strategy is the same as the military strategy. You want to saturate it in prayer so when you begin to talk, and then you want to have prayer cover as you're going out doing things. You want to be praying during Judgment House, not just when the event's going on or before, but pray while it's going on. It's a strategy. So keep that in mind. All right, we got to wrap it up. I know. Thanks for hanging in here with me. The purpose of the church is to glorify God. Amen. Amen. The mission of the church is to make disciples, and I put evangelism at the head of the arrow. Administration means in order to minister something, in this case the gospel, we do that through our worship, our ministry of missions, our discipleship, and our fellowship. But what does an arrow need to be launched? It needs a bow. And that bow is prayer. Now watch this. You take prayer out of it, and folks, this is what we've done with the church. We've taken this arrow in our hand, and we've tried to launch it. We may or may not hit our target. We may or may not accomplish our mission because we can only do what we're humanly able to do. But when we put the arrow in the hands of the archer who in this scenario is God, we begin to pray and he begins to pull back his bow. He's not going to miss his target. And what is his target? Is to seek and to save that which is lost. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the good attention of these people. And Father, Lord, as we have looked at a lot of things today, hopefully this is helpful. I pray that it is. Father, I hope that we will not see people as scenery or machinery, but we'll see them as a soul with eternal destiny. Father, I pray you'll give us greater compassion for people so that we want to share the gospel. And Father, just as your word is saying, Father, you're calling us back to yourself. You're calling us back to that relationship, calling us back to that experience with you so that we have a motivation and a passion to share with others. Father, fill us with your spirit. Anoint us for your service. Shod our feet in the preparation of the gospel. Cover us with your armor. Use us for your glory. And Father, today as we wrap up this time, I pray if there's anybody here today that has never surrendered to Jesus as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of surrender and salvation. And Father, for all of us who know you, may we have a greater concern to be about your kingdom work, to be on mission with you and for you and for your glory. Father, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.